And the attack starts with the human element. They're masters, as, as I mentioned before, in social engineering or hacking the person, often by posing as an employee and calling the IT help desk to request a password reset or MFA bypass, as, as we sort of discussed. So the that's basically it, is that they will pose as an employee, call the IT help desk, try to get their account or the person they're posing as account reset or their MFA disabled so that they can just get access. Hello and welcome to another episode of Data Security Decoded. I'm your host, Caleb Tolan, and if this is your first time joining us, welcome to the show. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you're notified when new episodes go live. And if you're a returning subscriber, thank you for joining us again. Make sure you drop a comment below, give us a rating, let us know what you think about the show. Now, in this episode, we were joined again by Joe Hladek, head of Rubrik Zero Labs. And if you recall, Joe joined us in the spring to share some insights about a new report from Rubrik Zero Labs. This time he's joining us to talk about modern adversaries like Scattered Spider that his team is monitoring and what defenders can do to prepare themselves and be resilient. Let's get into it. Joe, thank you again for joining us on the podcast. How's your summer been? What have you been up to since we had you last on the show? Summer, I think like any warm season goes by too quickly. Overall, it's been pretty great. I know been at least in the security community, there's been a lot of a lot of things, different things happening. I know today we're talking about Scattered Spider, so uh, it's been the focus of, of a lot of my work over the last couple of months. Right, right. Uh, no shortage of things to talk about today. So yeah, to dive directly into that, adversaries like Scattered Spider are highly organized, financially motivated criminal enterprises. Can you break down the motivation and business model for a group like Scattered Spider, especially how they use their tactics like double extortion to maximize their financial payout? Uh, sure. So they they are a nation state. Um, their primary objective is financial gain. Um, and as you had already mentioned, they're a financially motivated e-crime group, so to speak. Um, their business model is a shift from traditional sort of smash and grab ransomware, um, where, you know, most actors in the last several years have infiltrated different organizations and their mode of oper modus operandi has been primarily around encryption. Encryption of, you know, crown jewels, important assets, critical assets, uh, sensitive data, PII, PCI, that sort of thing. Um, and also applications and services. So if you're an e-commerce uh, company, that your whole business model is around your website in retail and that sort of thing. If that's taken down, for instance, and you can't take it up because the system's been encrypted, that poses a problem. Now, the the difference here is that they still do that. Um, but first, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about their business model. They become more or less a full-fledged ransomware affiliate within a ransomware as a service ecosystem or RAS, R-A-A-S, um, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, this allows them to monetize their access. Um, so for instance, there's certain brokers out there that that sell access to environments or sell exploits to undisclosed or unrealized vulnerabilities. Um, so all these different types of sellers are part of this ecosystem. And then there's also operators that purchase from these sellers or, or are the buyers, but they're also the ones that execute these engagements. Uh, so the key tactic you mentioned around double extortion, uh, it's an evolution from a single payment for decryption. They now steal large amounts of sensitive data from a lot of unstructured sources like say SharePoint or OneDrive. And then they threaten you with the public disclosure as leverage, right? This gives them two potential payouts. So even if the victim or the organization refuses to pay to decrypt their assets, then they can just expose it to the world or interested parties or stakeholders that, that, you know, in a geopolitical or a, a corporate espionage type of environment may, may work against you. 
Yes, it absolutely makes sense. And so adversaries like Scattered Spider and other groups with similar types of motives have shifted the ransomware playbook. Their techniques are defying traditional perimeter defenses. And so can you explain why identity as an attack vector is so devastating and why existing security tools are so blind to it? Yeah, you're going you're gonna to hear me talk about things like living off the land, which, which I'll get into a little more detail here. But um, this, is a, this is a critical point because Scattered Spider, their approach is, it's not new or novel, but what is novel is their, the way they're employing the techniques that they are. So they're not inventing anything new necessarily. Um, they don't rely on traditional malware that security tools are designed to catch. So that's number one. Um, they bypass perimeter defenses by using sophisticated social engineering. Uh, a good example of this would be vishing, uh, which is, it's the same as phishing, but, you know, through voice, right? And what that means is they pose, they're native English speakers, so they pose as um, empathetic, articulate, uh, well-informed and knowledgeable IT staff, right? So, you know, you, you pick up the phone, call your IT, but it's actually them, and then they you know, figure out a way to engineer you to under, to basically give them access. That's basically how this works. And this is, this means that they abuse legitimate administrative tools as a result. So by manipulating you as the user, they now use your credentials and then are able to pivot and access uh, cloud services that you had access to. And this allows them to move laterally within the network. And this is actually what's called living off the land, which I mentioned before. Um, so this makes it exceptionally difficult to detect uh, because traditional security-based uh, or traditional signature-based detection tools won't find this type of thing. You need to start employing things like anomaly and behavioral types of detection. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I find really interesting, though, is that they brought back an old technique that was not often used, which is bringing your own vulnerable driver, mainly because it's, it's an effective technique, but it's not an often used one um, until now. Um, and these attacks load signed but outdated drivers. And this allows them to dispo, like disable endpoint detection response products like CrowdStrike Falcon, for example, uh, rendering them useless. And this is particularly effective in virtualized environments where they can encrypt an entire hypervisor um, of VMs in seconds, causing you know total paralysis of critical surfaces like Active Directory. Um, and that that's pretty much the I'd say the the long and short of uh, what their the high level of what their capabilities are. All right, so could you break down that attack path a little bit further? What is it about legacy infrastructure that makes it so easy for them to sabotage a company's ability to recover and sometimes even take out that backup system itself? And the attack starts with the human element. Um, they're masters, as, as I mentioned before, in social engineering or hacking the person, um, often by posing as an employee and calling the IT help desk to request a password reset um, or MFA bypass, as, as we just, as you know, we, we've sort of discussed. So the, that's basically it, is that they will pose as an employee, call the IT help desk, try to get their account or the person they're posing as account reset or their MFA disabled so that they can just get access. Um, it's proven pretty successful. Um, this identi identity compromise gives them, um, you know, a key. And this key or this golden SAML backdoor that bypasses all security controls. So once they have that foothold, they're able to weaponize identities and move laterally, escalate privileges and so on. When they target legacy infrastructure, such as a backup system running on, say, a, vo a vulnerable virtual machine, um, it becomes a, like a perfect target for, for sabotage, um, mainly because they're most likely using native tooling. If it's in the cloud, for instance, um, they rely upon native services, which may lack a lot of the security features 
that are inherent to third-party products like native immunability, quorum authentication. So there are certain protective features that exist within some third-party projects that may not exist in native tools. And on the on-prem side of things and say legacy environments, there are some people that are still using backup software and methodologies that are decades old and they haven't modernized, uh, which are very easy to exploit as a result. So they, they, I mentioned before that they also, their technical capabilities also extend to hypervisor encryption. Well, if they're able to access the hypervisor and perform encryption, they can also access the virtualization interfaces um, to encrypt entire ESX, ESXi clusters. And this, this tactic can take an entire backup system offline. Um, and this is how organizations that rely on, on say an ESXi cluster and dealing with the hypervisor encryption, it may leave their organization with no way to recover at all. Right, right. That makes sense. So what are some of the key capabilities that organizations should look for when they're going through some type of modernization so they don't accidentally reintroduce the threat during our recovery? The speed of these attacks is really accelerating. Um, CrowdStrike earlier this year reported a breakout time that has dropped to as low as 48 minutes. And for those of, who don't know, breakout um, is not the same as um, initial access. It's the breakout time is how long it takes to achieve the ability to move laterally. So they've already gained access to your environment. And the breakout time is that now they're moving around. And the fact that that can all take place within 48 minutes uh, is pretty scary. So given that time is not on your side, I think resiliency is really going to shape up to be like the, the future in terms of, uh, managing a security posture, just, just security operations as a whole. So cyber resilience is the ability of an organization to prepare for, respond to, and recover from cyber attacks or other, um, digital disruptions while continuing to operate your critical business functions. So it goes beyond traditional cybersecurity by integrating multiple groups, such as risk management, uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, incident response, all into a unified strategy. The goal is not to prevent the attack, but to withstand them and then bounce back quickly with minimal impact. Um, therefore, cyber resilience to me and in, in, in our view is about accepting the assumption of a breach. Um, because with that attitude, that mindset, you're always thinking from a defensive posture um, and a mindset. And this means restoring both your data and identity systems to a trusted, clean state without reintroducing the attacker's backdoors or persistence mechanisms. So in instead of focusing like how quickly we can detect and respond, we also have to take those frameworks and metrics and extend it further by, well, how long does it take to not only detect and then respond, but also recover? Uh, I know most people are familiar with RTO, the recovery time objective, you know, which is a metric of how many times or how much, you know, seconds, minutes, days you can then return to that recovery. But what there is so much more that happens within the recovery process from scoping to identifying a, cl a clean snapshot to recover to, to then re actually restoring the, the data. Because if you're dealing with this over the internet and you have petabytes of data, that's going to take some time. That's not, <laughs> that's not a, a quick thing, even with a modern internet speeds. So you have to account for all of these different timelines, even the ability to verify. Once you've restored everything, your infrastructure, applications and services, then you have to validate everything is working. So resilience to us is that, well, let's reintroduce a new framework of not just detect and respond, but also recovery and include those two metrics in the overall framework. So you have a whole timeline from detection all the way to full business continuity. Right. I couldn't agree more. Resilience and recovery are just going to become more and more important as time goes on and as more organizations face adversaries like like Scattered Spider. So this has been great. Joe, thank you for sharing your perspective and insights. If folks want to learn more, where should they go to look? 
Uh, zerolabs.rubric.com. That's where we post all of our blogs, white papers, um, our quarterly. We're, we're, we're shifting from a annual report now to a quarterly one, or that's our mission right now. Um, so you can find a lot of that on zerolabs.rubric.com. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, Joe, thank you again so much. It was great. And until next time. All right. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks, Caleb.